NACDL is the Association of the Nation's Criminal Defense Bar. So consistent with the subject um, in race matters, I live in Atlanta. Atlanta is, as some people call it, hip hop Hollywood. And while I am by no means, no stretch of the imagination, an aficionado of hip hop, um, I've come to learn so much about that industry that really drives my city. And, and so my friend Rick Jones and Jeff Adachi and the other great public defenders in this country really lead the cause of, of a holistic approach to public defense, but I like to expand it. Um, our executive director, Norman Reamer, says, well, it's a holistic approach to criminal defense, and I like that. And, and we have to learn everything about our clients. We have to learn about the people that we represent. And we know one of the reasons that we're convened here today is because of the impact that this criminal injustice system has on people of color, and particularly young black men. And so part of learning about who our clients are is learning something about what they appreciate and something that they gravitate to. And I've made myself understand this genre and this artistic form of expression. I like when I talk, you know, I remember when I joined the public defender's office. Anybody remember the author when you were in college, Richard Wright? Right, black like me, native son. Okay, now most, you know, a lot of people here, like my kids are too young to remember. Remember Cliff Notes? I cliff noted my way through those books, right? The only thing I knew about Bigger Thomas was through cliff notes and all of a sudden I'm a public defender, I'm 24 years old and I'm in Atlanta and I'm meeting Bigger Thomas. And I said, I best get my butt to the bookstore back when we had bookstores and start reading and start learning because I want to know who I represent. When I had this great girlfriend, when I was at the public defender's office who ended up being my wife, I got my first battered woman syndrome case, which Mike was nice enough to talk about. I said, uh oh, I don't know about battered woman syndrome. My girlfriend, who's now my wife and I joined the local council and trained for weeks on how to be counselors. Now I was too busy to be a counselor, but I had Doris Jean Norman who was looking at a life imprisonment and I wanted to learn about that. So in like fashion, we bring that holistic approach to criminal defense and specifically this genre. And I'd like to just kind of segue into this. And just like that, just like that, Donald Glover, a year and a half ago, gives credit to Migos and their life changes. Now, they were a well-known band at the time. They were internationally known, but not like they were. And the moment those words left Donald Glover's lips, their lives were never the same. It's kind of interesting, right, because we see Stevie Wonder in the audience. I, I didn't even know that when I, when I put this together. But you see, Right in, in that song, it was actually a guy named Kiari Cephas, who's Offset, who really, who really was the focal point of that song, and that song that took them and put them on an international stage like no other. There has never been, that I know of, a band that has surged, and of course he marries Cardi B and the whole thing really takes off. But was it always that easy for this young African-American man from just north of Atlanta, was it always that easy for him and Quavius Marshall and Takeoff, the three guys that made it? Well, the answer is really no. So he thanks Kiara Cephas, who's offset, thanks his mom, thanks his grandmother who died of cancer, thanks God, and shows this, this decent side of who he was and is. But you see, just a little while before that, a couple years before that, for nine months, I would walk side by side, arm in arm, with his mom, Latavia Woodward. And we'd walk in Bullock County, Georgia, 
through the statue of a Confederate soldier because they did the, I would say, not so prudent thing and agreed to perform in South Georgia. And, and that was, that served as the launching point for me telling Rick Jones what we mentioned earlier about these trips through the South because what I came to realize then, even with their, their fame then, which was nowhere, right, because that was a couple of years before Donald Glover, but what we learned then was irrespective of how much money you had, irrespective of who your lawyer is, when you go to these places and you walk past the Confederate soldier statue, you're not in Baltimore, folks. You're not in New York. You're not in St. Louis. You're not in big city America. You're in the heart of the South. And let me tell you, what is alive and what is flexing its muscles is racism. And they didn't care that you're offset. So for nine months, he sat there. We had bond hearing after bond hearing and bond after bond hearing. And the New York Times could call me anything they want. But let me tell you what I couldn't do is get him out on bond. So let me give you an example. Because, you know, there are prosecutors. You look, I, I you know, the, you know, I just spoke to the American Prosecutors Association, which is the, the progressive prosecutors. And there are some decent folks doing this there that are addressing issues like lack of brain development in, in late teens and there's some decent folks doing it. But then you run into the dark hearts, right? Then you run into the people that lie. Because see, if we lie, we get disbarred. If we lie, we get prosecuted. But when you prosecute and you lie, nothing happens to you, right? The Supreme Court told us that in a 5-4 decision by, by Justice Thomas. Nothing happens to you. So you can do this when you're there. You can absolutely, at a bond hearing for a young African-American man, just BS out the you-know-what. Migos is actually a name taken from the street gang, Black Migos Gang. Lie. Migos is like Migos. Three friends that went to Burkmar High School. So I hate to disillusion anybody, by the way, that thinks that Migos are like from the streets and were involved in gang fights. They're suburban kids. Okay, trust me, dear suburban kids. I tell Quavo all the time I could take him in a fight. Okay, all right. In which Mr. Cephas and others are members. Mr. Cephas has posted in social media that he is the CEO of the gang Black Migos gang. Just bold face fiction. I'm talking Pinocchio stuff. All right, these are lies. And you know what? We're in South Georgia, heads are nodding. Judge is nodding. I thought the judge was going to get whiplash he bought into this BS so much. <clears throat> we have learned that Black Migos gang consists of over 120 people. There may, there may have been some Black Migos gang, but it had nothing to do with three suburban kids that can sing the heck out of a song. But what they did is they, they were hunting. They were lying in wait for this group to get there. And unfortunately, when they pulled up with their vans, with their security people, they smelled like weed. And they all go in and the whole thing begins. <clears throat> the band takes its name, the Black Migos Gang, and it is in fact proliferated, proliferated criminal activity for its membership. Um, and then it goes on and on. And I love this at the end. Then they introduce a, a video, which I'm actually show part of. It. The video is being offered right now solely for the purpose of bond under which impermissible character evidence does not apply. I got to tell you, I thought I was losing my mind. All right. But but here it is. It singles out this genre. There is this perception, and I don't care because I'll show you some stuff later. There is this perception that hip hop, that rap music is somehow all tied up in violence and drugs, and that's crap. And if we buy into it, if we sit at this bar later on at 5.30 and go, I gotta tell you something, these young kids and this rap music, it's nothing but, that's bull. These are young people, just like when people were into Elvis Presley and whatever else that expressed, they're expressing an art form and expressing a frustration. Rick Jones talked about it earlier, right? He talked about the suffering. Well, the way to express it, express it, unfortunately is not through sometimes 11th grade term papers. It's not through sitting around, okay, like, like Woodstock and listening to Joan Baez by the campfire. 
This is how these young people, and I want to talk to you. I'm very aware of the fact that I'm just some white dude. Don't get me wrong. But I have gone out of my way. I have really gone out of my way to try to understand, just like I did reading Richard Wright, just like I did going to counseling and understanding what it's like to be physically abused by your, by your spouse or your partner. I have tried to learn about this because hip hop is a reflection of the social struggles, in particular, racism. In particular, the frustration, the anger that people feel. We sit in our isolated lives, in our homes, in our offices, and we don't know what goes on in between the ears, in the gray matter of our clients. So following through in this holistic approach to criminal defense, to try to understand who we represent, let's take a look so we know what folks are thinking about. I'm gonna start from the bottom up. Edgar Allan Poe, that's a sick dude, huh? That is a dude who is obsessed with crazy, weird, perverted violence, but in 10th and 11th and 12th grade or middle school or whatever, you're reading it, aren't you? And I can guarantee you, I can guarantee you that if I say, raise your hands, if you've had a bond hearing or a preliminary hearing or a trial where they've introduced or attempted to introduce Edgar Allan Poe, not one of you would raise your hands. In fact, they'd commend it. You'd use it at a bond hearing. Your Honor, I'd like you to know that young Jonathan, who is at the private school of holy innocence, is quite the poet. He fashions himself after Edgar Allan, Edgar Allan Poe. Bond granted. Francis Ford Coppola. I mean, we all loved, we all loved the horse head at the end, end of the bed. But nobody said that Francis Ford Coppola was somehow a gang leader, did they? Nobody's introducing his movies as evidence of a crime. Nobody's introducing the scripts. I'd like the court to know that the night before this assault, the defendant watched Apocalypse Now. Would that ever happen under any set of circumstances? Or Quentin Tarantino, come on. Are, are, I mean, are you kidding me? Film after film, Reservoir Dogs? Even I can't handle that. I mean, violence, 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 but never do we see that being used. See, maybe you'd see it in a case where mental health is at issue, but you're never going to see it introduced at a trial, at a preliminary hearing, at a bond hearing. Your Honor, I'd like the court to know the defendant was watching Pulp Fiction the morning of the crime, but yet we single out this music genre and in my opinion, having represented a boatload of folks and been and advising other lawyers around the country, it's only because of one reason and one reason only. And that is because it is a genre, it is an art expression that is dominated by young people of color. And these young people, do they have a sense of frustration when they seek to, to express themselves, and not only express themselves as the performer, but as the person listening, when they seek to choose something to listen to that expresses the pain that they feel inside. This is what they contemplate. They contemplate what happens to Eric Gardner in Staten Island just because he's trying to sell some cigarettes for a few cents because they're not so-called legal cigarettes and dies. Philando Castile, who dies. Tamir Rice, Michael Brown, Freddie Gray in Baltimore. Young people, they see this, they hear it, and they're in pain because of it. And they look to some way to express how they feel. And let me tell you, okay, let me tell you that the literature they're being given in social studies is not satisfying, it's not quenching the pain they feel. You know, we, we, we think all the time about uh, the pain, the, the, the cultural pain that we feel, okay? Uh, as a Jew, I feel the pain, right? When, I, when my wife and I are walking through Auschwitz, and I'm like, oh, that 
hurts. My Armenian friends that gather every year to talk about what their people went through when they died by the millions, they feel that pain. Well, young people, young people feel the pain of this. They feel this pain. And see, they not only feel the pain of that. I have, um, let me tell you, because of the clients that I have, and they know that, uh, that I do this, they, they actually ask about these speeches and stuff. I get this stuff, and by I'm gonna tell you, I have an Instagram account, and, and my two kids that are here run it. I don't even know how to post on any Instagram, okay? But my clients send me direct messages of videos of people getting their ass kicked by cops all the time. I have one particular client, my son knows who it is. He, I don't even understand how he gets access to these videos. So these are horrible. But this stuff is going down all the time. When we go through, uh, when we went through Mississippi and Alabama, we have this colloquy that we go through. And it's mostly Rick because we're going to public defense providers. And one of the things he says is, he goes, you know, my friend Drew, he says that, you know, we hear about what happens in Staten Island and Ferguson, which is St. Louis, and what happens um, in Minneapolis and Baltimore. These are big cities. But Drew says that these incidents happen every day in the rural South. And to a woman and man, every single person has affirmatively responded to him saying that's true. So young people feel that pain, not just from what's on TV, but what's always to them going on. And, and, and then they see, they see when there's an attempt to exercise your First Amendment right, you're batted down. So when you get to, this is what they hear and they see, they watch TV, they don't, not only not watch TV, but they get on, sorry, I'm using a prop, they're on this phone 24 seven. And in social media, in social media, they're hearing stuff before you ever hear it. By the way, I always ask this question, who here has an Instagram account? Who doesn't have an Instagram account? You're ineffectively assisting your clients if you don't have an Instagram account. <laughs> you, you, you have violated Strickland. And, 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 don't, and don't tell me, don't say, I hear you, I get it, I get it, I don't have any social media, then don't try cases. Because you are wiping out a, a you cannot pick a jury, as Eric just told you to, if you're not hearing the, the, the expression of a, of a subgroup that's 18 to 35 years old. You just eliminated a whole group of jurors. You eliminated a whole bunch of information that Eric told you you need by doing it. So they're hearing very, very quickly what happens. All these people have done, all these people have done is try to exercise their right because they feel pain and they're batted down. And so that's what young people hear. And then of course they see that if you are in an organization like Black Lives Matters, which by the way, I, I name it Black Lives Matters too, because it matters also. All of a sudden the federal government thinks that you know, you're some kind of violent conspiracy. And here's what also, also young people see. Young people say, okay, they have idols in different ways, right? They have people they look up to. And so they see that a young person is making millions of dollars who ESPN Sports Science did a special on because of his amazing physical skills, who replaced Alex Smith, one of the top quarterbacks, and led his team to a Super Bowl. To a young man as a young, again, I'm very aware of white, but I try to be well, well read on this. They understand that one of their idols, Colin Kaepernick, his, when he was an undergraduate, tried to study his black history. He wanted to understand his roots. His journey didn't begin when he took a knee, because you're an ignoramus if you think that. If you don't take the time to study this young man, but these young people do, they know that his journey began as an undergraduate, went as a Division I full scholarship athlete quarterback at University of Nevada. He pledged a black fraternity because he wanted to find out who he was, who has pledged millions and millions of dollars to fight abusive immigration issues, who has fought for reproductive rights, let alone his search for his, his black identity who a great humanitarian, 
merely exercise his First Amendment rights. Young people learn that pretty early. You don't have to even wait till high school. You're learning that in fifth and sixth grade. And I'll tell you something. I, I, I gave a speech earlier this year, and I, I got, you know, a lot of hell for what I said, but I'm going to say it again. We are all entitled to our interpretation. So I exercise my First Amendment rights. I say, as president of NECDL and contemplating what this country is going through, I say all the time, we are rebranding, redefining what a patriot is, right? right? In our courtrooms, we always thought patriot, not us, but other people thought a patriot is somebody that wears that stupid little red, white, and blue badge when they're sitting next to the jury. But the true patriots in the courtroom are us, because we're fighting for the people. But a patriot is somebody that fights for what they believe in, that sacrifices for what they believe in. So my belief right now is the greatest patriot in America today is Colin Kaepernick. Yeah. Because I don't know a person that would give up 10 to $20 million a year to take a knee. And so young people see that, and it makes them, as Rick says, it pains them to see because he slapped down. So now you see a couple years ago at, at, at the BET Awards, Kendrick Lamar singing a song that, that is nothing but a reflection of positivity, right? We're going to be all right. We see, we see what happens when people are shot in the streets, but he sits there in front of the tattered flag, and he says, we're going to be all right. That's it, positive message, that's all we can ask for, which by the way, fast forward in last year, what does he win? A Pulitzer Prize. But you're a young person, let's go back a couple years, right? And you reflect on this and you say, wow, man, this is great, I feel really good. Maybe this country is making a turn for the right. Maybe things are just getting better. And then you hear this. This is why I say that hip hop has done more damage to young African Americans than racism in recent years. Wow. I mean, it may be Fox, but really? Yeah. I mean, hip hop has done more for racism than racism to impact young black folks. I, I, you know, every time I watch that, I'm just, I don't even know how to respond. What do I say? Race ipsa loquitur. My son's a 1L, so he's excited <laughs> I said that. Um, and so this is what young people see. The number one job in America, the point of person, is someone who doesn't understand the people and really don't give a fuck about the people. As someone once said, shut up and dribble. So here's this, here's this, here's this guy that, let's do a contrast. There's one guy that starts a university that just ripped working people off, right? There's one guy that for, is, is a fraudster, we all agree with that. I mean, every day is like discovery in a federal case, all right? <laughs> and, and then there's another guy that starts a school for free. And so the one guy that's decent and that gives back is told to shut up and just dribble. In other words, <laughs> hey, black guy, let me say this on national TV, just do that thing, you know, entertain us. So as all the white season ticket holders can sit on the side of the room and go, Mar marvelous job. LeBron, Le LeBron is doing wonderful today. That's what they want. I, I, I say LeBron is, is a fine athlete, but tell LeBron not to speak. We don't, want, we don't want to hear him speak. That's all that message was. I mean, unless you hear it differently than me, that it is black athlete, continue to entertain us. But other than that, shut up, we, we just want you to do your sport. And, and I just, and I say over and over again that this adds to that, that sense of frustration. And, and these, hearkening back to what I said earlier, when we sit down with our clients, when my daughter, who, who is a public defender that will, will 
be here tomorrow because she had like jail visits at her public defender's office today. When she's looking through the plexiglass, when my son who's a 1L and he's interning at a public defender's office this summer, when you're looking through that plexiglass and you're looking at that young person, all these things impact who they are, impact decision making, impact the DNA that our, that our society bakes into who we are. These things are cumulative and we must think about them all the time. So, just because I got to get CLE points for y'all, I had to put a few cases in here. And by the way, it can't be, it can't be more fortuitous because if you're an NECDO member and you have the champion, anybody get the new champion? There's an article in there on this subject and there's actually more cases in there. So put that down for the CLE thing so I can go through this quick. Um, so this is actually a case that everybody talks about. Um, it's, it's a New Jersey case, um, and it's a, it's a reversal. Um, and it, it, the prosecutor attempts to introduce lyrics, stating that violent, profane, and disturbing rap ly lyrics authored by the defendant constitute highly prejudicial, ev this is the decision, highly prejudicial, prejudicial evidence that bore little or no probative value to any motive or intent behind, behind the attempted murder case. Probative evidence may not be found in an individual's artistic endeavors absent a strong nexus between specific details of the artistic composition and the circumstances of the offense. And I'm gonna contrast that to the next case um, because that case, um, if you look at that opinion and compared to some old opinions that there was a greater nexus, they were just literally throwing in the guy's collection um, of, of these lyrics and somehow trying to tie it into to the offense. Um, <clears throat> more on the other hand, um, was the guy was, and, and we've seen these cases, um, the guy was just not really an artist and, and was really reflecting the fact that he was dealing drugs and was talking through his lyrics about all the things that were contemporaneous with his drug dealing. Um, but the best one of all uh, is, is Robert's decision um, in, in this decision in 2015 where he had social media posts um, that they were intended to be were, posts were intended to be threats and not merely artistic expressions, which the government failed to prove. That's what they were supposed to prove. Therefore, the government's efforts, efforts were not sufficient to support a conviction. Um, so they're putting the burden on the, on the government to show that nexus there. Um, so th there are attempts, and I get this from lawyers constantly. Um, I think the best one uh, is uh, that I just, I just got, which was, um, I'm respond, you know, one of my favorite things is to uh, convert somebody to being a criminal defense attorney or a public defender. It's like this very cool conversion process. And so I had a case uh, several years ago and I was in the Southern District of Alabama. I was representing an ascetic Jew from New York and Israel and I had to use a translator. And so I got a uh, ascetic Jewish fellow that was one of I think three ascetic lawyers in the state of New York and he was my translator. And so we traveled everywhere working on the case and he had a really good civil practice. He has sold his practice and, um, and is now an associate in, uh, in a Brooklyn criminal defense firm. It's pretty cool. And um, now that guy, that guy's coming to our Nashville meeting and I can't wait for him to be there. But so about two weeks ago, he starts contacting me and it's just so funny because I mean, he's this ascetic Jewish guy and he's done all this research telling me about he has a case and they're trying to use rap lyrics and he's just bombarding me with case law. And I said, hey, I'm speaking a couple weeks, you should send me some case law. So I will tell you um, that Leo Gross in Brooklyn, an ascetic Jew, I think is now officially, has more case law on the admission or lack thereof of, of rap lyrics in any criminal case in anybody in America. Uh, so contact him. Leo Gross, he's an NECDL member. It's the coolest story to me. Um, so. Like I said earlier, it's our understanding to, to learn and to understand the culture and the, the, the musical genre as well as the lyrics. And the significance of that is that prosecutors um, take this thing it, it called trap music and somehow they think uh, that it is this uh, memorializing of all things criminal. What it is, is trap music Right, and coming from me, like my kids are dying over here, they're like, you don't know what you're talking about, okay? But, but trap music to me is the artistic expression of observation. It is, you know, if anybody's old enough to remember how the whole thing, right, went from powder cocaine to crack cocaine, and all of a sudden, those of us that were public defenders then, caseloads expanded by like 
hundreds and thousands. It was out of control, the number of cases people had. And so trap music really was an expression. It was an observational, artistic form of what was going on. It didn't mean that somebody that performed this music was a criminal, but they were observing it. People have observed in artistic form wars, battles, death, dying, and it didn't make them criminals. When, when, a, when a painter portrayed the American Revolution or the Civil War, it didn't mean that they were killing people at the time. They were making an observation. And so trap music, music was an expression. But at the same time, in, in, this, in this community, in this community that endured this surge of, of the in, infiltration and infestation of drugs and crack cocaine, um, there was a work ethic associated with it. There was an economy to it. And, and so this next interview that takes place is, we talked about the group Migos. This is Migos when they were teenagers. And I thought, and I wrote about this in, in this article that I wrote for the Champion Magazine, um, this is a pretty interesting observation by a guy named Quavius Marshall, whose name is Quavo, who's as famous as anybody in the world right now. This is him when he's probably 18 years old and he's kind of a fledgling musician that's in this, um, it's by Vice that does this. And, and so what, what Quavo is saying there is trap, the mentality of trap has nothing to do with, with, with drugs. It has to do with grinding. It has to do with working and working hard. And I will tell you something, um, in this industry is not different than our industry, right? Because, you know, if you're a trial lawyer and you're leaving work when you're getting ready for trial, if you're leaving work at five, six, even seven o'clock, find a different job, right, Jeff? He, none of his people are doing that. Not the ones that he's always talking about getting not guilty verdicts. They're working, they're grinding. And all he's saying there is this idea of trap is about working hard. It's about 24 seven mentality. And I'll tell you one thing, you read anything, anybody that knows this group knows these guys are in that studio 24 seven. Um, I'm gonna talk in a second uh, about, about Gucci. Anybody that read or knows anything about Gucci is the hardest working pe person in the music industry, always has been and will be to his last breath. And that's all they're talking about there. But that's misinterpreted because the outside world wants to look at trap as just having something to do with drugs. So, so this guy Walk is doing a, a video and LAPD shut him down because they thought it was gang activity. I mean, they shut him down. And all they were doing was they had all the licenses, they had everything. They were preparing a video, a music video. And LAPD, I had to put that one in there because I'm in LA. I thought that was pretty, pretty outrageous. Um, they did it, but this is the type of, of visceral reaction these guys get. And then I just put this in there because I just wanted to show off. I tried his case and got a not guilty verdict. That was, that's totally ego thing, sorry. Um, okay. <laughs> so I talked earlier about uh, social media and I always put this in there because I really do uh, believe in this. So when I speak around the country, um, and this presidency, man, I'm gonna tell you something. This thing will, anybody interested in being president? You could, <laughs> you could take my next six months. Um, you know, I always say to, to, to me, the three biggest problems with the criminal justice system, and there's a lot of them, are mass incarceration, racism, and collateral consequences, right? We know it. All right, we, we, we know, we all know, right, that we're 5% of the world's population, but we're now getting close to 25% of the world's incarcerated population, right? We know about racism in the criminal justice system. We know that if you're an African-American man in your 30s, there's a greater chance your foot has touched the inside of a jail cell than it's touched the inside of a university. We know about the well over 2 million incarcerated African American men in our prison system. We know that. We know about collateral consequences. It frustrates us, right, to know about the fact that you can't get a job or a job paying a living wage, that you can't get a student loan, that you can't get a loan for a home. We know about those collateral consequences and we talk amongst one another all the time, right? We write letters to the editor, we get editorials, 
but not a lot gets really done. And then a hip hop artist, a rapper in Philadelphia named Meek Mill gets his probation revoked for three to six years because of two things while he was on probation. Well, number one, he had a judge who was an African-American woman and it doesn't mean anything because that system, that system has nothing to do with who the judge is, it has to do with the system. He was, keeps on extending his probation, right? Keeps on, let me tell you something about the continued extension of probation. Probation is just got, at some point, it just becomes the 21st century form of shackles. That's all it is. It's just shackles. And we talked earlier, someone talked about electronic monitoring. I mean, you know, electronic monitoring, that's electronic shackles. That's all that is. It's demeaning, it's ugly, and there's no need for it. And I get, I'm ADD, so I'll talk about anything at any given time. But, you know, it, it, it just pisses me off. And so we get, so she gives him 10 years of probation. You put me on 10 years of probation, I'd violate it once every six months. Okay, and so she does that. So what happens? I'll tell you what happens. Instagram. Instagram. The rally for Meek Mill. They shut down the freaking city of Philadelphia. No letters to the editor. Due respect to NACDL and ACLU and NAACP and everybody else. No. You know what it took? It took young people who, through this situation, educated themselves. If you went into Instagram and you read, you'd see young people talking about these issues that we're pleading for them to know. They're talking about mass incarceration. They're talking about racism, and they're talking about collateral consequences. And it's funny because, the, the, before I get to that, probably, if you go back, because it's not part of this speech, the, I've studied all of the Meek Mill posts on Instagram, like the, really, the ones that really got people going, that really got people going. And the most intellectually honest one, the most succinct one, the most well-written post was by Colin Kaepernick. He really is, to me, um, the, the, the unwritten of hero in the Meek Mill movement. He does a lot of other folks, conversation from another day of trying to kind of steal the whole hoopla of it. And the second person, because I'd be remiss and criminal for not saying this, because I gotta say it, anybody that's studied it knows who's responsible for his freedom and it is Philadelphia Public Defender's Office. Because they were the one that unearthed the, the, the fraudulent behavior of the original arresting officer. And so while others have gotten the accolades, I like to say Meek Mill really was the catalyst in public, in, the, in, the, in social media, and the public defender's office did an outstanding job of unearthing the behavior of that officer, which ultimately resulted in Meek Mill's freedom. So <clears throat> this community, this hip hop community, and I say the community, I mean the young people that believe it. I think they set an example for us. I put three people up here. All three have felony convictions. All three are thriving. And here's why they're thriving. Because young people are forgiving. This community of people, this community of supporters, this community of people that share, share I can never say it. I don't understand the difference between C-H-A-I-R and C-H-E-E-R. How do you say cheer? Cheer. Cheer, thank you, my daughter's helped me. These young people that cheer these folks, they are forgiving. We have something to learn from the way their fans treat them. We have something to learn from the people that are downloading their music, that are flooding to see them in arenas and stadiums all over America and the world, because it is amazing to me that young people forgive them, but a freaking corporation won't give somebody similarly situated a job. Our society, our government has something to learn 
from the people that pack these arenas, from the people that download these musics. If you can download a song from Gucci, who served three years in the federal system, if you can download and go and watch Waka, who seven years ago did like a year in, in middle Georgia, or, or Kiari Cephas, who's offset with, with what he's gone through, then why can't a company have somebody who's not famous walk in and get a job? And I'll tell you something else. You know what the three of them also have in common? Corporate America puts them in shoes, puts them in clothes, puts them in vehicles, puts, down, puts them in planes, gives them everything. But I'm gonna go on the record and say 95 to 90%, 99% of the companies that do that for them wouldn't employ them if they walked in to get a job sweeping the floors. So we have something to learn from these young people. They can teach us. They can teach us. So when I say about social media, you got to do it because you got to see the conversations that are taking place. It is extraordinary, extraordinary. And it's, and it's weird that on this day, um, my kids brought to my attention, there's, there's a, a, a young uh, woman, what, City Girls? That's, that's, anybody here City Girls? They, they made famous the expression, period. Like you say something and you go, period. Like, you know what I mean? Like racism needs to stop in America, period. And Michelle Obama put the stamp of approval on it because she gave a speech like a month or two ago and ended her point by going, period. So now there's this social media that's blown up my phone, a social media movement because a lot of young people don't understand federal sentencing, right? They think it's like state, there's no parole. Social media this morning has gone insane. People have decided that she served enough time. And I think it's unbelievable. And, and, and so if, coincidentally, for reasons we can talk about another time, I'm getting stuff nonstop my kids say about it. So now I have to try to get to, somehow get to people and understand, hey, it's, it's the federal system. It's the stupidest freaking thing in the world, right? You can't say I've been a good person in this jail for a year. I haven't done anything wrong. I've, I've worked on my education. I haven't been in trouble. I deserve to be released because somebody in the mid 1980s made a decision that we're gonna have an unforgiving system and have truth in sentencing. So we're just gonna cage people. But nevertheless, it, what matters to me is that since about nine o'clock this morning, young people all over America, if not the world, are talking. They don't realize it about the unfairness of federal sentencing. And that's amazing to me. And we need to harness that and see how we can work on it. So <clears throat> uh, I'm, I'm gonna finish talking about this guy. Um, and in fact, uh, um, I know that um, Stevie was running a little bit late. How, how close are we to Stevie time? Good? Okay, I'm gonna run out of gas pretty soon, man. <laughs> Actually, give me a mic, I'm gonna rap. Um, so, <clears throat> so uh, anybody know who Gucci is? Okay, right, so Gucci went in and did his federal time, and, lo and look at the difference of him, right? Then and then after three years he got out and that was, that was at his wedding. And then, this was posted the other day. In fact, his, his lawyer is one of my best friends. He's outside, he's, he's actually Steve's lawyer. Um, he's here, I'm gonna introduce him in a second. Um, but this just, heart, this just warms my heart. So this was what he wrote to his wife on her birthday. This is over the weekend. Thanks babe for being there for me when so many turned their back on me. I love you and for the rest of my life I'm going to make sure every day is your, is your birthday. And literally, Keisha K. Orr, um, anybody, anybody know who Keisha is? Yeah, so Keisha K. Orr is, is a cosmetic queen, best way to put it. I mean, she dominates the cosmetic industry. Um, people that think like, oh, Gucci's so, you know, she's so lucky she married Gucci, uh-uh. Uh, William's her lawyer also, so he's back there smiling. We'd agree, Gucci's lucky she married him, and he just waves his hand, yes. She is a, a, an entrepreneur, as you'll ever meet, and she stayed, two, uh, two things, two things changed uh, his life. Um, and that is that uh, he, he asked for a civil lawyer for when he got out, somebody that would really just take control of his life, because as I explained to him, that's not my thing. 
And so um, I was friends with William Briggs. I said, look, I know the greatest guy in the world who happens to be my friend. And William Briggs went to him in the plexiglass. Literally, I remember it was like yesterday and said, I'll be your lawyer. And, and patiently they planned his release and his lawyer, who is the same lawyer as, as, as Stevie's, um, was his lawyer. That's the first thing. He got out and had a plan of attack with a great lawyer, had to really pick up his life. And, Steve, and William has fought every collateral consequence in his ways and built a great life for him. And then he had a partner. He had a loved one that stayed committed to him throughout. And of course, that's important for any, any of the people um, that go through this. And, and so um, he, he, one of the things that he did is um, he wrote music when he was in. Like, it was crazy. He wrote song after song. And so my, my son Zach and I went to see him. He rented a house when he got out. He went to see him, and he showed Zach and I this wall. He had papers, and he had scrap papers. He wrote all these songs, and because he's brilliant. And by the way, uh, these folks are brilliant. Like, I can't even finish Roses are Red, Violets are Blue let alone write like 25 verses, you know, like he does and never even write them down and write song after song after song after song. But one of the songs that he wrote, God bless you, um, was this. Now, I'll tell you something. Anybody that thinks this is not an art form and doesn't appreciate the fact that when, when he was in jail, it was like she was in jail too, um, really um, doesn't have quite an ear because I don't hear really anything. I don't know the words to any songs, but I can hear the words there loud and clear. Um, and, and so, the expression that he talks about there, about the, the, the suffering that he endured being incarcerated and that his loved one um, endured that with him, to me, has meaning that affects us. And, and the meaning that it has affects us is as follows. And this is when I do the shameless plug about this organization. Everything we do in our profession is together, right? Because what I do in Atlanta affects Ian Wallach in Los Angeles. The grounds that I break and the progress that I make in Atlanta may help Ian. It, 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 may, help, it may help somebody in Cleveland. It may help somebody in San Diego. We are a unique profession because we need each other. We need the, the relentless effort of working with one another, the coordination, the fact that you can sit on an NECDL listserv and be struggling with an issue and ask a question in Newark, New Jersey and have somebody in, Mo in Monette, Missouri answer it is unique to our profession. And so just like Gucci said, we ride, we ride together. As criminal defense attorneys, we ride together in this profession. And so we need one another and so I'm going to end this and give you a break by just saying it's an off subject, right? You know, the impact of hip hop. But it's something that we need to think about. As in any other subject, the impact that it has on young people, the observations that, that they make, and, and, the, and the suffering that folks in our society endure. Um, but we need to be learned on it, and, and I, as in any other subject. So, um, Gucci and Keisha. They ride together, we ride together, NECDL rides together. Um, so if he's a few minutes out.